<laughs> Hello, good morning, everyone. My name is Daniel no, no. Oliveira. Oh, it's it's live, Raquel. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah. <laughs> My name is Daniel Oliveira. I'm the chair of the Brazilian uh, committee, special committee for bi com biological computing from the Brazilian Computer Society. I'm here to welcome you to BSB 2021. We are starting this opening session and I'll call the, the, the names of the participants. First of all, the Professor Raquel Minardi from Federal University of Minas Gerais in Brazil, the general chair. Professor Maria Emilia Walter from uh, University of Brasilia, the TPC chair. Professor Mario Bella Hernandez from Simvestad, Mexico. Professor Peter Stadler from Leipzig University. Professor Marcelo Brigido from Brazilian University, the University of Brasilia. Professor Marcelo Reis from Instituto Butantan in Brazil. Professor Valdez Mendes from the Federal Institute of Goiás. And finally, Professor José Viterbo representing the Brazilian Computer Society. He's the director of publication of the Brazilian Computer Society. We all would like to welcome you to BSB 2021. And then I'll call Raquel Minardi, Professor Raquel Minardi, to open this event as a general chair of BSB 2021. Raquel. OK, thank you so much, Daniel. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's a great satisfaction to initiate the Brazilian Symposium on Bioinformatics. And um, the BSB uh, began in 2002 and was then called Brazilian Workshop on Bioinformatics, WOB. And it was renamed to BSB in 2005. So in the next year, BSB will celebrate its 20th anniversary. Uh, it's an annual event uh, organized by the Special Committee on the, Compu uh, of, uh, on the Computational Biology of the Brazilian Computer Society. It's, um, it's an event of great importance for its intrinsic interdisciplinarity bringing together scientists and students of computer science and life sciences. Uh, and this is proved to be more and more fruitful in solving both open problems in science and problems with a high impact on society, such as problems in the area of health and biotechnology. Uh, for these reasons, bioinformatics has been considered a strategic area for scientific and technological development. This year, due, due to the continuation of COVID-19 pandemic, the event is taking place online again. The program consists of five days filled with lectures by international uh, renowned invited scientists, uh, technical sessions with the presentation of uh, the selected papers, round tables and short courses. Until yesterday, we had about 100 people enrolled 30% uh, of whom were undergraduate and uh, 57 were graduates. So we believe that an important mission of attracting and training new talents in the area is also fulfilled here. Uh, the, event, the event will be broadcast in its entirety here on the SBC channel uh, to reach more people, both live and after the event. The short courses, round tables and special committee meeting will be carried out by Zoom. Um, this will allow a greater interaction in real time. Um, don't forget to, res to register in advance for Zoom sessions uh, and uh, they require approval for entry, okay? Uh, reg reg regarding invited speakers and article presentations, they will be broadcast on YouTube and we ask you to send your questions uh, through the, the chat so that the chair of each session with the support of the team uh, can organize the questions at the end of each session. We emphasize that the meeting of the Special Committee on Computational Biology is open to all those registered on, uh, on, the, on the event and we encourage everyone to participate. Um, I would like to thank each member of the organizing committee by name, Professor Daniel de Oliveira and Professor Valdei Mendes, uh, the coordinator and vice coordinator of the uh, EC, and also Dr. Marcelo Reis. Uh, your participation in the organization of this event was essential. 
I thank Professor Maria Emilia Walter for accepting to coordinate the program committee and each of the members of this committee for their careful work and dedication in reviewing each article. I also thank Professor Sergio Lifts for suggesting my name for the organization of this event at last year's BSD and the colleagues Daniel, Valdei and others who supported this nomination. It was an honor to take on this role this year. Um, I would also to thank the graduate program in bioinformatics at UFMG for encouraging and supporting the enrollment of its students uh, so that in this edition of BSD, we have uh, more than 25 participants from UFMG. Um, I'm also grateful for the support of the Secretariat. Thank you, Tiago and Sheila, for your support as always. I thank the UFMG's Computer Science Department for accepting to organize BSD and the Brazilian Computer Society for holding the event. Uh, in particular, Camila Lucy for her guidance. Uh, finally, I would like to thank Ria Bio, Mexico, for its sponsorship, and PUC Rio, and the National Council for Scientific and Technological Development, the CNPQ, for their financial support. I conclude uh, thanking the participants for their interest in the BSB, welcoming everyone, and wishing you a very fruitful event. For any questions or access difficulties, we are available by email, bsb2021 at dcc.ufng.br uh, throughout the event. Thank you and have an excellent event. Thank you, Raquel. Uh, I'm going to, to call Professor José Viterbo, now representing the Brazilian Computer Society. Viterbo. Thank you, Daniel. Good morning to all. Uh, I'd like to, to greet uh, all the, the people present here at this uh, opening ceremony, uh, both the, the colleagues and also the, the audience that's probably watching us uh, by YouTube. And uh, I'd like to say that for me, it's a joy to be participating of another edition of the BSB. Uh, I think it's probably the second one uh, that is, going, is happening remotely online. And uh, on behalf of the president of uh, the Brazilian Computing Society, Professor Raimundo Macedo, and also representing the director of events, uh, I salute the bioinformatics uh, special interest group represented by Professor Daniel, that is responsible for uh, uh, keeping the, the, the group together and uh, supervising the organization of the events. It's always a, a victory for, for the special interest group when you are, are successful in uh, holding another edition of the event, and especially in this case that it's uh, online. Again, it's uh, 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 2021. Uh, it's, we are al already ready for this, uh, uh, this situation because we had to learn a lot last year. But now we are go, go going probably to, to face another uh, challenge that is, is to take the, the events to the uh, uh, old model, to bring it to the uh, in-person in, in events again. So I, I, I hope that uh, not only this one, this edition is going to be a, a huge success, but that you together can think about the next year, how, how the things are going to to, to be in the, in the year coming. It's uh, another different situation. And we in the events uh, industry that we can say that it, we, we all are involved, we had to, to, to take this challenge, both in this side and also in our classroom. So we are all uh, uh, really uh, winning a different challenge. And, um, uh, I'd like also to um, uh, thank Professor Raquel Minard, that is the, uh, main, the, the, uh, the main organizer of this event. We know we at SBC, we try to, to help, uh, to, to support uh, uh, as much as possible, but still uh, the, the people that are in charge of each uh, edition, 
they have a, a really hard work to put everything together. Uh, as Raquel told, uh, as Raquel said, she had the support of all the, the community, uh, be, uh, sending uh, uh, articles, sending papers, revising papers, and then uh, being here now to participate. It's a, a, a group work, but uh, Raquel, uh, we understand that uh, it's very uh, difficult, it's very hard for the organizer and the people directly involved. And we have to thank you very much. And you and all the people that take this, this challenge of uh, organizing new editions of the events. And uh, after that, I would like to, uh, to wish that uh, you all have a, a, a good moment uh, participating of a Brazilian symposium on bioinformatics. Thank you very much. Thank you, Viterbo. Now I call Professor Maria Emilia Walter as a TPC chair, Professor Maria Emilia. Good morning to everybody. In the first place, I would like to greet all of you presented here today for this opening ceremony. My colleagues from the Technical Program Committee, Peter Stadler, Marcelo Brigido, and Maridel Hernandez, the organizer, the organizer of the BSB 2021, Raquel Minardi, Daniel de Oliveira, Valdeir Mendes Silva, and Marcelo Reis, Professor José Viterbo from the Brazilian Computer Society, the invited speakers and the participants of the roundtables and all the participants of this event. As Professor Raquel just said, the BSB is an international conference covering many aspects of bioinformatics and computational biology. This event is held annually since 2005, and the BSB is a new name of the world, as Raquel said, which started in 2002 with three events. As in past years, the special interest group in computational biology of the Brazilian Computer Society organized the event under the coordination of Professor Daniel de Oliveira. A program committee was uh, in charge of reviewing submitted papers. This year, the committee had 42 members and each submission was reviewed by at most three program committee uh, committee members. There were two submission tracks, 21 uh, full papers and, oit, uh, and eight short papers in a total of 29 were submitted. In the full paper track, 10 papers were accepted, while in the short paper track, five papers were accepted. All of them were included in a volume of lecture notes in bioinformatics, LNBI, and will be presented orally during this week. Besides to these technical presentations, BSB will, in this year, will receive four invited speaker, speakers, João Setubo from the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil, Angelica Cibrian from Silvestat, Mexico, Mark Helmut from the Stockholm University in Sweden, and Daisy Gizzi, from the Northeast, Northeastern University from the USA. Also, we have a special session dedicated to bioinformatics and artificial intelligence coordinated by Dr. Maribel Hernandez. And the event will finish with three roundtables with the objective uh, of exchanging ideas among students, researchers, and professionals that are participating from the event. And uh, the participants can choose the roundtable uh, that uh, he, they will, uh, each one will follow. And these roundtables will be coordinated by uh, Professor Peter Stadler, uh, who will debate themes that will be in the radar of bioinformatics in the next years with the title Covadis Bioinformatics. This is uh, Roundtable 1. Roundtable 2 will be coordinated by Professor Maribel Hernandez and Professor Vinita, who will think about STEM questions and challenges in bioinformatics 
And the third round table will have the coordination from Professor Steve Hoffman from the Fritz Lippmann Institute in Germany, Professor Elizabeth Tapia from CONICET Argentina, and Professor Tania Carrillo Roa from uh, Roche uh, Diagnostics. They will talk a bit about career opportunities in academy and industry. Finally, I have to thank many people who made possible this BSB, as Raquel already mentioned. Thanks to all the program commit committee members. Gratitude to the local organizers and volunteers for their work and for helping out with many, many challenges during this organization. To the sponsors, CNPQ, Book Hill and Ria Bill, uh, Raquel already mentioned this, for making the event viable. To the Federal University of Minas Gerais, the University of our General Chair, Professor Raquel Vinardi, to the Brazilian Computer Society, here represented by Professor José Viterbo, and to all the members of the Special Committee for Computational Biology of the Society that supported the event. To Springer for having agreed to publish the volume with the proceedings and their staff for working with us uh, on finishing this volume. It will be published in the next weeks. Uh, it's fin uh, all the work was finished. Especially, we would like to thank all the authors for their time and effort in submitting their work. Professor José Viterbo already mentioned this. After almost two years of uh, COVID-19 in the entire world, we are really very glad to, ha to have received these contributions uh, that have continued, although all this uh, pandemic and tragic situation. Thank you all for participating in the, our symposium and have a, a very fruitful and interesting week. Welcome to the BSB 2021. Thank you, Professor Maria Emilia. So again, welcome everybody to, the, to this event. I hope you have an excellent week with us. So we are going to start now the, the first keynote, the first keynote session. It will, it will be a tribute also for Professor João Setubo that we all know. Uh, Raquel uh, will start a video for, for this tribute and Professor Peter Stadler will be the chair of this keynote. So thank you again and welcome to BSB 2021.
vez uma menina muito pequenina que não sabia o que a esperava na vida. Mal sabia ela que iria para o Unicamp ser professora, onde encontraria um colega maravilhoso e que este colega iria fazer doutorado nos Estados Unidos e que ao voltar daria um dos primeiros cursos de bioinformática do Brasil. Uai! Cadê ele aqui na foto? Tem outra melhor. Dá para reconhecer? Mas quem é esta colega? Olha eu aí, olha eu aí. E uma dedicatória da qual muito me orgulho e por isso eu guardo com carinho até hoje. E hoje retribuo para o meu maravilhoso e querido Setúbal, imenso orgulho pela homenagem tão merecida. E terminando o show de fotos, uma foto recente de 50 anos atrás para não comprometer com a cara de hoje. Mil beijos e carinho. Eu fui orientando do João Carlos Setúbal e da Cláudia Bauser Medeiros de 2003 a 2007 no Instituto de Computação. Eu tenho muito a, a agradecer. Né? Nesses anos de convívio, eu sempre admirei muito toda a competência do Setúbal e, em particular, a capacidade dele de montar um time multidisciplinar com alunos de graduação, alunos de doutorado e vários outros pesquisadores de diferentes áreas para conseguir atingir aí um objetivo de desenvolver um bom projeto de pesquisa. Né? Se, é, hoje eu sou também um professor pesquisador, muito disso é graças ao Setúbal e a minha orientadora também, a Cláudia, então é, eu tenho muitíssimo a agradecer a ambos e fico muito feliz em poder estar aqui dando meu depoimento e fazendo essa homenagem ao Setúbal. Falar do professor Setúbal é sempre muito interessante, ele tem uma personalidade bastante peculiar. Ele é um pesquisador ímpar, mesmo entre, entre profissionais de, de qualidade, assim, na área de ciência, ele, ele é um ponto fora da curva, né? Ele é um grande professor, é um grande orientador, ele é muito humano. E ele, uma coisa interessante dele é que ele não tenta falar de cima para baixo, né? ele tenta se colocar no lugar do aluno, ver realmente as intenções, o que o aluno quer para o futuro acadêmico dele, em vez de colocar uma visão dele de cima para baixo. E eu lembro de uma passagem muito legal com ele, eu tinha em determinado, uma, em determinado momento eu conversei com eles que eu tinha gostado de um, de um livro de bioinformática, que era bacana e tal, e umas duas semanas depois, num outro contexto, eu estava na, na sala dele, falando sobre o meu projeto e tal, e depois da reunião acabar, ele falou, José, eu tenho aqui um presente para você. Aí ele me deu justamente aquele livro que tinha falado com ele duas semanas atrás, tipo, ele lembrava, entendeu? E eu nunca esperei que ele, sei lá, fosse me dar o um livro. Eu nunca ganhei o um livro de supervisor. Então, isso para mim foi bem bacana. Boa tarde a todos. Aqui é o professor Tiago Venâncio, da UENF. É uma grande honra para mim estar aqui hoje gravando esse depoimento em homenagem ao professor João Setúbal. Setúbal foi meu co-orientador de doutorado, é, aprendi muito com ele durante esse importante período da minha formação, ele foi autor de um livro absolutamente seminal para minha geração e para outras que vieram depois, participou dos sequenciamentos dos primeiros genomos realizados aqui no país, é, foi absolutamente essencial para o estabelecimento e consolidação da bioinformática e biologia computacional no Brasil. Após uma importante experiência internacional, felizmente ele pôde retornar e eu espero poder continuar com ele cerrando fileiras aqui no Brasil é, é, em prol da ciência nacional. Um grande abraço a todos. Olá, aqui é o Marcelo Reis, do Instituto Butantan. Eu tive o privilégio de ter o professor Setúbal como mentor em minha graduação na Unicamp, onde ele foi orientador da minha
Divulgação Científica né, do Laboratório de Bioinformática e também docente em duas disciplinas que eu cursei. Eu tive nele um exemplo da importância do trabalho duro, da seriedade e da integridade da carreira acadêmica. Além disso, é importante mencionar que o professor Setúbal ele é sempre super solícito com seus alunos, mesmo após eles alçarem os próprios. Eu dou um exemplo do meu próprio caso, em que ele apoiou meu interesse em participar da organização deste mesmo evento, o PSB, e me apresentou aos então membros do comitê. O único exemplo dele que eu ainda não consegui seguir ainda é ir de bicicleta de casa para o trabalho. Não sei se ele faz isso ainda na química, mas era um bom hábito que ele tinha lá no IC da Unicamp. Mas enfim, é, é, parabéns pela homenagem para o professor Setubo, ela é merecidíssima. Que a sua carreira siga produtiva e muito bem sucedida. Um abraço. Eu sou Aline Maria da Silva, professora do Departamento de Bioquímica do Instituto de Química da USP. Fiquei muito feliz com o convite para falar um pouquinho sobre o professor João Setúbal, que recebe essa merecida homenagem. Setúbal é meu colega de departamento e, mais do que isso, é o meu colaborador científico mais frequente nos últimos décadas. Eu conheci o João no final dos anos 90, durante o sequenciamento do genoma da chilela fastidiosa. Quando o João decidiu retornar definitivamente ao Brasil, nós iniciamos uma colaboração para implantar a abordagem de metagenômica no estudo de comunidades microbianas. do Parque Zoológico de São Paulo. Esta colaboração inicial foi o embrião de um projeto temático financiado pela FAPESP, que nós denominamos de Projeto Meta Azul, e que foi coordenado pelo João e por mim. Os dez anos de convivência próxima com o João têm sido de aprendizado intenso e mútuo na geração e análise de dados de genômica e de metagenômica. Em particular, eu destaco o benefício dessa, dessa parceria aos nossos alunos, uma vez que o João é um orientador de fato, que acompanha direta e continuamente cada aluno envolvido nos projetos que ele coordena ou que ele colabora. É notável a contribuição do Setúbal para a implantação da área de bioinformática no Departamento de Bioquímica do nosso Instituto e também na USP, principalmente pela participação decisiva que o João teve na consolidação do Programa de Pós-Graduação de Bioinformática, do qual ele foi coordenador por vários anos. Eu vou terminar esse breve discurso sobre o João Setúbal dizendo que tem sido ótimo muito produtivo e divertido trabalhar com o João, a quem eu admiro pela objetividade, clareza de ideias, senso de justiça e muito bom humor. Parabéns, João Setúbal, por esta merecida homenagem. Fiquei muito feliz. com o convite para participar desta homenagem. Conheço o João há mais de 30 anos, desde que entrou na Unicamp como aluno de mestrado e, ao mesmo tempo, docente do nosso departamento.
Sigo desde então sua brilhante carreira acadêmica. Mas não vou querer comentar toda essa trajetória dele. Todos os detalhes estão no currículo lá, se eu não teria tempo nem de longe para comentar todos eles. O que eu gostaria realmente de fazer é destacar a pessoa João Setúbal, que eu conheço há tanto tempo. Destacar suas qualidades como seriedade, o seu trabalho, ensino, pesquisa, extensão, relação, é, a sua dedicação à instituição, tanto no trabalho acadêmico como no trabalho administrativo, excelente relacionamento com os colegas, sempre pronto para ajudá-los, enfim, um professor e docente completo. Parabéns, João. So, I hope this works and everybody can hear me. <clears throat> it's my great pleasure to welcome Jean Setubal as our first keynote speaker this year. And I would like to add to the good wishes uh, that we had in the video. It's a little bit weird for me uh, to introduce you, uh, Setubal, to a Brazilian or mostly Brazilian audience. Uh, but nevertheless, the tradition has to be honored. Uh, so, let me start with our speaker. The Department of Biochemistry of the Institute of Chemistry at the University of Sao Paulo. His, uh, his lab known as the SETU lab, mostly nowadays focuses on machine learning approaches in bioinformatics, using classical machine learning techniques to solve in particular problems uh, in genomics and metagenomics, using deep learning these days uh, to a broad array uh, of problems uh, from uh, mostly viral and bacterial bioinformatics. Setubar is really one of the pioneers of bioinformatics, not only in Brazil, of world, but worldwide. Uh, he got his PhD from, in computer science from the University of Washington in 92, and then returned to Brazil, uh, where he was a professor at the Institute of uh, Computing at Unicamp in Campinas uh, from what, 1986 until 2005. He was also a professor first and researcher at the Virginia Bioinformatics Institute and the Department of Computer Science at Virginia Tech in the United States uh, in uh, the first decade of this millennium. And then a professor uh, at the Biocomplexity Institute at Virginia Tech over the last uh, 
Uh, uh, the Panguar was <clears throat> first people to coordinate the first genome project in Brazil uh, uh, on Xylella fastidiosa together with Shaumedanis and Sao Paulo Kitajima uh, in the uh, 1990s. Uh, and he's certainly one of the most important bioinformaticians uh, in Brazil uh, to this day. He's also did a lot for the bioinformatics community, uh, including coordinating the internet, interdisciplinary postgraduate program in bioinformatics at USP. Uh, until very recently, he's a member of the advisory committee for biophysics, biochemistry, uh, uh, and uh, physiology and pharmacology and neurosciences uh, with CMPQ. Uh, and he's one of the first and foremost people working on a wide array of omics projects in Brazil. So uh, with that, I think we can go to the more interesting part, Setubal, which is your presentation. Uh, on, uh, <clears throat> uh, sorry, uh, uh, on microbial genome informatics in the microbiome area. I'm very much looking forward to your presentation and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Peter, but I think Raquel wants to say something. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt, but um, we have a surprise. Um, we have here, uh, just one minute, Professor Claudia Bowser Medeiros and Professor Nalvo Almeida Jr. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Is it my turn? After you, Professor Claudia. This is a big honor, okay, uh, to come after Nalvo and so many wonderful people. And I'm speaking in English, so Peter will understand my lifelong attachment to Setubo. Uh, which is translated in the short video I provided. And I'm here wearing the same clothes, okay, that I, I wore in the video 30 years ago, which, so it was not just a matter of looking for pictures, but finding the clothes. And uh, congratulating my most wonderful friend and colleague, and I will try to, in English, express myself as I would in Portuguese. It's a wonderful <laughs> honor to be here, and uh, congratulations to you, okay? Parabéns, é uma grande alegria e uma grande honra poder participar dessa homenagem tão merecida. E agora eu vou sair de cena para o Nalvo falar. E muito obrigada aos organizadores por essa oportunidade. I thank the organizers for this opportunity to see again, even if virtually, my wonderful friend and colleague, João Carlos Setuba. Congratulations. Okay, good morning, everybody. Nice to see you again, Professor Peter. My name is Nalvo Almeida. I'm professor at Federal University of Mato Grosso do Sul, in Campo Grande, and former PhD student of Professor Setubal. Professor Maria Emilia and the organizing committee of BSB 2021 invited me to write some words in honor of Professor Setubal. And I thank them very much for this opportunity. I had the honor of being Professor Setubo's doctoral student starting in 1995 at the Institute of Computing, Unicamp. I was, in fact, his first PhD student to complete in 2002. 
a PhD program that starts with the study of some theoretical problems in computational biology, and then completely changing the direction when the challenge of sequencing xylella-fastidiosa arose. These challenges made Professor Setubo, along with Professor João Meidanes, to create the lab of, for bioinformatics, LBI, carry out research in bioinformatics and computational biology, providing support for genome projects and training lots of children. And as everyone knows, they made history, not only because the importance of the Zalela projects and all the difficulties faced at that time, but also because the project completed in January 2000 became an opportunity for many young scientists to consolidate themselves as independent bioinformatical researchers. It's amazing how Professor Setubo makes a difference whenever he goes. I also worked with him at Virginia Bioinformatics Institute at Virginia Tech, where he hosted me for two years. There, I learned, I learned more about bioinformatics, of course, but I also learned a lot about hard work, about persistence, about resilience, about partnership, about discipline, about understanding that no matter how hard you try, a paper will never be perfect. And definitely I learned that. Once a PhD student, always a PhD student. And for me, it's okay if it continues like this forever. Professor João, on behalf of all your former 19 master students, 15 PhD students and 11 postdocs, thank you very much for your help, your wisdom, your patience, your understanding, your companionship, your empathy, empathy your simultaneous happiness and seriousness, your commitment, and for your impressive ability to understand and overcome difficulties so easily. And on behalf of bioinformatics and science in Brazil, thank you very much for our efforts in producing so much for area, in training so many people with such dedication and competence. Talking about BSB, thank you for pushing our symposium from the beginning. By the way, the Symposium Computational Biology of the Brazilian Computer Society was baptized as BSB by João Setubo, who had this idea in one of our previous lobby workshop on bioinformatics, which was in Brasilia. The airport of Brasilia is BSB, and based on this idea, Setubo suggested renaming lobby as BSB. Your idea was perfect. Now we can see that this effort has been worth it, and if we are here today at BSB 2021, it's also because your dedication and support to BSB, and especially in recent days, years, sorry, supporting also the special group of computational biology of the Brazilian Computer Society. This group has been very important to scientists of computer science and other areas, as well who work in bioinformatics. I spent the whole time writing this speech looking forward a single word that was able to represent how you made difference for all those who have the chance to be by your side, whether as a student, as a colleague, colleague or as a, as a friend. And the word could not be different. Gener generosity. Your generosity welcomes us and makes everything easier. Thank you very much. That's it. So all that remains for me is uh, to echo the sentiments and the congratulations uh, for great achievements in bioinformatics and lot many, many contributions to the field. And I'm really looking forward to hear what's new. Okay, my good friend, Peter, thank you so much for this nice introduction. And thank you, Maria Emilia and Marcelo and Maribel for uh, organizing this event, for inviting me to uh, be a speaker uh, today. And of course, for organizing this uh, uh, very moving ceremony, uh, which I don't think I deserve. Um, I, I, I would like to thank everyone who uh, uh, 
who, who made comments about me, starting with my beloved friend, Claudia Medeiros, uh, also Luciano de Gianpietri, José Patané, Tiago Venancio, Marcelo Reis, Aline Maria da Silva, and my beloved uh, advisor of my master's dissertation, Tomasz Kowaltowski. So uh, I am very moved by all these uh, testimonials and very thankful. And I hope I can meet every one of you in person in the near future so that I can give my thanks in person. Um, okay. Uh, let's uh, move on with the talk, and I think I have to share my screen with you. Let's see if that works. Can you see my screen, Peter? Raquel, can you confirm that you can see my screen? Well, I'm not sure. Let's see here. I want to make sure that you can all see. Okay. Okay, you can see the screen. Now you have to tell me whether you can see uh, when I change slides, okay? Did you see my change of slides? Did not see my change of slides. Mm. Ah, okay. It's better if you say this on the mic because I, I don't have to, to keep going back and forth between presentation modes. Um, Peter, can you, I will start a presentation and if something is not right, please yell, okay? I'm just waiting for feedback from people to make sure that the presentation is working fine. Professor, can, can you hear me? Yes. Ah, that's good. Uh, we can see your presentation, but it's in the edit mode. Can you put it in the full screen in the presentation mode? It's, yes, um, I can. Be and, and, and then please let me know if you can see the change of slides, okay? Yes, okay. Is it changing? Yes, it, it's changing. 
Oh, excellent. So, but we can see it very small. It's not in the full screen mode for us. Really? Yes, we can see the, the right, uh, the, the left bar side and the, the top bar, the two bars. That's strange. Mm. Ah, that means that you're, you don't see. So let's stop the screen here. And now let's share again. Okay. Let's see if that works. Can you see my screen, Raquel? Not, uh, not yet. Uh, yes, that's perfect. That's perfect. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Can you see the change of slides? Yes, yes. All right. Now we're in business. Okay. Thank you. Let's get started. So, um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, welcome to this uh, talk about microbial genome informatics in the microbiome era. Um, I chose this topic uh, uh, because um, it's basically uh, what I have been doing for the past uh, several years. Um, and I'd like to start out by saying that uh, uh, historically and primarily personally, genomics and bioinformatics have been two fields that have been together. They are interwoven. And I can't really distinguish between one and the other. And of course, genomics and bioinformatics are ways in which we uh, are methods that we use to uh, get a better understanding of life on Earth. And uh, I always like to say that this whole thing started uh, in 1995 with this paper published in Science, which was the first bacterial genome, Haemophilus influenzae, which was uh, done by a team uh, led by Craig Venter at Tiger. And uh, this was the first sequence bacterial genome. Uh, it pioneered shotgun sequencing uh, to generate the genome. It also pioneered semi-automated fragment assembly. And it's important to point out that some people up to that point thought that this was impossible, that uh, uh, there was no human being and no computer programmer would be able to put together the millions or thousands at that time of fragments uh, and, and put together a genome. And uh, I think uh, Craig Venter and his team uh, had a, uh, has have the great merit of demonstrating that it was possible. And they also pioneered genome annotation techniques uh, and they used primarily on BLAST. And it's interesting to uh, uh, look at that 26 years later and see that uh, most of the things that they did in that first paper are still valid today. Uh, but on the other hand, one curious thing is that the word bioinformatics does not appear on this paper. Uh, I think in 1995, uh, most people still used computational biology to refer to the use of computers in uh, helping uh, process uh, biological data, molecular biology data. And it was only uh, a few years after that that bioinformatics became a word of widespread use. And uh, five years later, I was part of the team that published the first uh, plant pathogen uh, bacterial genome, uh, that was the Xylella fastidiosa genome, uh, which made the cover of nature. Uh, uh, and this was an effort that uh, uh, was possible in large part because uh, the uh, 
but PASP agency decided that it was important to fund this kind of work. And by the year 2000, the word bioinformatics was already firmly established. So uh, before uh, talking about what uh, about the microbiome era, I wanted to give a brief, very brief overview of what happened in these last 26 years in genomics and bioinformatics. Um, most people know, most people in this audience will know that sequencing costs went down dramatically and that the number of microbial genomes sequenced increased exponentially. And bioinformatics became a household name. This is not really true. Um, it is my experience that whenever I meet people for the first time or even relatives and they ask me what I do, if I say that I work on bioinformatics, uh, most people will simply uh, look at me uh, with uh, uh, a, a face in which it's as, as if I had spoken some words in Greek. They have no idea what bioinformatics is. So I think uh, uh, we still have to go a, a certain distance before bioinformatics really becomes a household name. And I have to say that uh, the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic probably helped. It was, it, it, it is a, a, a tragedy. It's, it's a horrible thing, but it, it, I think it helped uh, bring uh, bioinformatics uh, to more people because bioinformatics uh, uh, was very important. Bioinformatics and genomics uh, were very important in uh, tackling this horrible disease. So uh, I wanted to show you this graph of the number of microbial genomes in GenBank. So you, on the x-axis, you have uh, time expressed in years. On the y-axis, you have the number of genomes. And you can see that uh, starting with the first one in 95, uh, basically it exploded. And uh, today, uh, or more precisely yesterday, I checked the GenBank website and the total of microbial genomes available uh, is nearing 400,000. So it does look exponential uh, if you plot it this way. But uh, I also decided to plot it in log scale. And to my mild surprise, I was expecting to see a straight line. And of course, a straight line in a log scale is exponential increase. And what I found out is that uh, there is a slight decrease. It's not truly exponential. And I wonder whether this is a, a long time trend or uh, it's just a hiccup before the next big increase in microbial genomes. But uh, regardless, uh, the number of microbial genomes has grown uh, by leaps and bounds in these uh, last 26 years. And uh, to give you a perspective of how, how phenomenal this, this, the revolution that DNA sequencing brought about, I, I will bring you a, a, another paper. And it's this paper from 1973. So this is a paper uh, whose author is Jerry Rubin. Uh, who later became, at, at that point, I think he was a postdoc in Cambridge, England, but he later became a very, a, a very prominent scientist in Drosophila research. But uh, uh, this paper, he published the nucleotide sequence of the yeast uh, ribosomal RNA, one, one unit. And a curious thing of this paper is that the abstract of the paper is the sequence itself. It has 158 uh, uh, base pairs, um, and it's uh, kind of funny that uh, uh, at that time uh, someone could publish a paper uh, putting the sequence in the abstract, right? Now, um, uh, almost 50 years later, uh, I don't think we, we, we would have uh, enough libraries if we wanted to uh, write out all the sequencing that has been done. Okay, uh, I also wanted to share with you uh, some 
what I think are landmarks in my microbial genome informatics. Of course, DNA fragment assembly uh, was the first and, and a very important one, as I already pointed out. Genome annotation tools and resources have also in, uh, improved enormously in the past 26 years, as have genome databases and websites. And more recently, uh, as most of you are probably aware, machine learning took off not only in uh, genomics and not only in molecular bi biology, but in uh, many, many fields. Uh, and uh, we are now uh, going through a, a revolution thanks to developments in the machine learning uh, field. Uh, one, one development, one bioinformatics development that was very important in microbial genomics was the first COG paper. COG is the cluster of orthologous groups resources. Uh, it started uh, with this paper in 1997 by Tatusov, Eugene Kuning, and David Lippen, who at that time was director of NCBI, uh, and then many other uh, developments in, in the COG resource followed. And one which was uh, a, 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 a watershed in my own research was this paper, uh, OrthoMCL, Identification of Orthologue Groups for Eukaryotic Genomes, published in 2003. And even though they say eukaryotic genomes in the title, uh, this tool called OrthoMCL uh, uh, also applies to microbial genomes. And uh, it changed my life, uh, the, the availability of this uh, ortho-MCL uh, program. Uh, because this is uh, an event uh, sponsored by the Brazilian Computer Society, and I assume that uh, most of my audience uh, will be of computer science students, I wanted to point out that uh, this uh, ortho-MCL uh, program is based on the MCL algorithm, where MCL st stands for Markov clustering. And this was a PhD thesis of a computer science student. And his name, uh, if I pronounce it correctly, uh, is probably Stein Marinus van Dongen. And the name of the thesis was Graph Clustering by Flow Simulation at the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands in 2000. And it's a, a, a theoretical paper. I'm sure that uh, uh, Peter Stadler uh, will uh, agree with me that this was a theoretical uh, development, uh, a very important theoretical development, which made a huge impact in practice. So, and I can uh, give evidence for that, that the paper derived from the thesis has more than 3,500 citations, and the ortho-MCL paper has more than 5,000 citations. Okay, uh, this is the URL if you want to learn a little more. Now let's uh, go into the microbiome era. So uh, I need to, uh, not everyone is probably familiar with microbiomes, so I thought I would give a brief introduction. So uh, uh, before the microbiome era, we were, uh, uh, when we talked about microbial genomes, we were talking about isolate genomes. And also the word bulk genomes is used in the literature, in which the microbe is cultivated in the lab. And with the advent of metagenomics, uh, there's no need of for cultivation. And this gave rise to the microbiome era. And in this talk, my focus will be, will be on this uh, uh, object, this entity called metagenome assembled genome, or MAG, in which the genome is reconstructed from metagenome data. Um, it's important to mention that uh, microbiome is different from microbiota. Microbiota are the organisms, the microbial communities living in some environment. The microbiome are the molecular components of the microbiota and mainly genomes and genes, but also proteins and metabolites. In metagenomics, I think that a best, the best definition is the method to generate microbiomes. 
And very briefly, given an environment such as the soil, plant leaves, the human saliva, human gut, or whatever, you obtain samples, you do DNA extraction, you do DNA sequencing, and you process the results. And uh, process the results, meaning process the reads, and this is basically bioinformatics. It's also important to mention that there are two kinds of microbiome projects. One on the left, in which you uh, target marker genes, usually uh, ribosome RNA units such as 16S, 18S, or ITS for uh, eukaryotes. And on the right, you simply do total DNA, also known as shotgun metagenomics. And the uh, uh, MAG, the metagenome assembled genome, needs the approach on the right, total DNA. You can't do, you can you can't generate genomes based simply on marker genes. So. Uh, Again, uh, as an introduction, you generate millions or billions of reads from all or nearly all organisms in the sample. Then you assemble the, the reads, you obtain contigs, and then the contigs are binned. And by binning, you obtain the mags. And uh, mags have been uh, being generated uh, for many years now. Uh, uh, Probably the first genome uh, retrieved from metagenome data dates from more than five years ago. But nowadays, uh, we are undergoing a revolution. And I can show you the, the signs of this revolution by uh, mentioning two papers. The first is this paper from Cell, uh, January 2019. And you can see from the title, Extensive Unexplored Human Microbiome Diversity Revealed by Over 150,000 Genomes from Metagenomes. And then a year later, which means last year, uh, in Nature Biotech, there was published this unified catalog of more than 200,000 reference genomes from the human gut microbiome. Not all these 200,000 genomes are uh, MAGs, but the vast majority are. So, uh, with this as background, uh, one would like to ask, what is new or different in microbial informatics in the microbiome era? Of course, uh, MAG reconstruction methods is one new thing. MAG databases is another thing. Phylogenetic placement is also important to mention. And I will also talk a little bit about what I call the metadata problem. And finally, microbiota modeling. Of course, this is a very short list. It depends on the details that uh, one uses to describe uh, uh, these uh, research uh, in microbiomes. So you can you can look at this list as a personal list, uh, which is by no means exhaustive or anything. Okay, the methods for obtaining MAGs, uh, I've already talked about them, assembly and binning. Uh, here is a, 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 a nice figure from a, an introductory paper from 2015. Uh, I don't have time to go into this. Uh, it suffices to say that uh, 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 from uh, shotgun data, you have, if you have sufficient coverage, then you can indeed retrieve uh, many genomes from metagenome data. Uh, instead of, of talking about the techniques for reconstructing MAGs, I wanted to focus on the reality of MAGs. And uh, the question I want to ask is, well, uh, you take reads from metagenome data, and then you reconstruct, and you generate this object that uh, we call metagenome assembled genomes. And it's a, a very fair question to ask whether these genomes are, do correspond to uh, biological re genomes, to the biological reality. Uh, we've always had a concern with contamination when assembling isolate genomes. So uh, when asking about whether a given MAG is real, uh, this question is not really new. Uh, but in the case of isolate genomes, there wasn't any question as to whether the, the, the culture which, from which you extracted the DNA 
was the organism that you wanted to sequence. Um, of course, uh, extraneous DNA always came into play, but uh, for the vast majority of projects, uh, the bulk of the DNA that was extracted from cultures was from a single organism. So what's different here is that with Max, we have to be more careful. The entire genome may be a fake. And I quote here from a, a paper published this year, early this year, uh, at the journal uh, uh, Genome Biology and Evolution by Bill Martin's group uh, in Germany, in which they criticized uh, another paper for uh, uh, drawing lots of conclusions from mags that they thought were not really uh, real. And they used these words. They were unnatural constructs, genome-like pat patchwork of genes. So, uh, and, and they also said that those errors might lead to snowballing errors in further analysis. And I, this criticism perhaps was a little too strong but I think the fact remains that we do have to worry about the reality of Max. So uh, are Max real or not? Uh, in my experience, many high quality Max do seem to be, and I would like to say are real, but uh, one always needs to be careful. And I'll give you an example by what I mean. So uh, I, I have uh, done work uh, uh, with uh, uh, in metagenomics uh, from the composting of the Sao Paulo Zoo, and one of the mags that we uh, were able to reconstruct, we could assign it to a species called Thermobifida fusca, and uh, we knew that it was Thermobifida fusca because we compared it to. Uh, isolate genomes from NCBI and we find found a good matches but for this talk I made a, 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 a new comparison I searched the uh, NCBI database for an isolate genome from thermal bifida fusca which was complete and I found this train UPMC 901 and uh, the metadata says that uh, it was obtained from an oil palm compost in Malaysia and the genome is complete. If you compare our MAG to this isolate genome, uh, you will see that it has an average nucleotide identity of more than 98%. And more than 93% of the reference sequence is covered by context from the MAG. So it's a very good match. And such a very good match, I think, um, adds evidence that this MAG uh, we, that we obtained from the compost, Sao Paulo Zoo compost, is indeed uh, Thermobifida fusca. And both came from composting samples, which also is reassuring. And perhaps even more important than that is that Malaysia is on the other side of the planet. So what are the chances that we here in Brazil would sequence uh, uh, DNA from a compost and, and generate a mag and this MAG would match uh, this isolate genome from the other side of the planet in such a nice way, just by chance. So it's quite likely uh, very close to zero. And which means that I think this MAG is indeed real. Um, but having said that, uh, we need to accept a certain degree of genomic heterogeneity when talking about Max. And in order to explain that, I like to use this analogy to the uh, light spectrum. Uh, on the right side of the spectrum, you have the single cell genome. So this is the most homogeneous genome that you can think of. In the middle, you have the isolate genomes or the bulk genomes, which is already not as pure as single cell genomes. And on the left, you have the Max. So it, it's, it's a continuum, and uh, the MAG is, by, by being on the left side of the spectrum, it means that MAGs, most MAGs are probably mosaics 
of same species strains genomes. But we've already lived with mosaics for a long time because the isolate genomes, they are also mosaics. They're mosaics of the different single cell genomes that you find in the uh, cultivation plant. So I think we are simply going a bit to the left on this spectrum when dealing with MAX. Uh, I also wanted to point out that comparative genomics is a very helpful tool when asking uh, about the reality of biological reality of MAX. Because you can compare a MAC to isolated genomes and to other MACs. And when we do that, the results that we get can be of three kinds. The first is a good alignment to known and named isolated genomes. That's exactly what happened with the Thermo bifida fusca example that I just showed you. The second is a good alignment to other MAGs from different samples. And the third is no hits. OK. Uh, I was thinking about this, and I realized that we've been here before. And we've been here before with protein coding gene predictions in genomes. Whoever has worked on genome annotation has done a blast search of open reading frames, meaning our gene predictions, and obtained three kinds of results. First, a good alignment to genes with defined function. The second is good alignment to genes without the defined function. And in this case, we call uh, the annotation of uh, those predicted genes. Uh, the standard is to, is to use the name conserved hypothetical protein. And the third is no hits. Hey, there's an analogy here. Uh, uh, and the no hits, uh, we call the hypothetical proteins. So there's an analogy here. And I think uh, if you're... Pay attention to what I'm saying. Probably you already have this analogy in your head. But here's a little table that sh shows it in full. On the left-hand side, we have the protein coding genes. On the right-hand side, we have the mags. So protein coding genes with a defined function correspond to what I call the S-mag or the species mag. The protein coding genes that are termed conserved hypothetical we will call the CH MAC or conserved hypothetical MAC. And finally, the hypothetical genes are analogous to the H MACs or hypothetical MACs. And now, with this uh, nomenclature, we can talk about the non conserved H MACs. And uh, I'm, I'm being redundant here for clarity. Uh, and for them, the only evidence for biological reality is the same methodology argument. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is, well, we have a certain methodology to obtain mags from uh, metagenome data. If that same methodology generates S mags or mags that have nice alignments to known isolate genomes, why would we think that a mag, which is an H mag, would not be real, right? Well, I think there is some strength to this argument, but also uh, it has its dangers. And in order to explain these dangers, I will show you a little secret. And it's this chart here, of predicted protein coding genes and the genome of Xylella fastidiosa 985C. Though this is the genome that was on the cover of Nature 21 years ago, of which everyone is so proud of. Okay, so uh, in that paper, we predicted that the genome had 2,900 protein coding genes. That, if, you look, if you look at the abstract of that paper, you will see that number right there. Right after we published that paper, uh, those of us working on the bioinformatics side realized that probably that was an overprediction. We used uh, a software called Glimmer to predict genes, and it turned out that Glimmer made had a, a sort of a, a high rate of false positives. And five years later, uh, we and colleagues published another paper in which we compared the Zalela 
I study also genome to other genomes. And in that paper, we lowered that number from 2,900 to 2,200. And just yesterday, I decided to check the RefSeq uh, record of this same genome. RefSeq is the uh, sort of the gold standard of genome annotation for microbial genomes available from GenBank. And uh, I found out that uh, the RefSeq genome for this genome currently has nearly 2,500 uh, gene predictions. So it, it sounds like uh, we, are, we were a little uh, too uh, stringent in the 2005 paper, but still with 2,500 papers, uh, the, the number of putative false positives with respect to the uh, original Nature paper is more than 400 genes, which is 14%. And 14% is kind of a high rate of false positives. And uh, so I'm showing you that because uh, if one were to use the argument, hey, we use the same method to predict genes that are real as the genes that are hypothetical, one could say, hey, um, you have to be careful because uh, some of your predictions might be wrong, might be false. And with Max, the same thing. Okay, having said that, let's go on. And uh, 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 one could also argue, well, well, let's, uh, not many people worry about hypothetical genes. Why should we worry about hypothetical MACs? Well, it turns out that at present, most MACs are hypothetical MACs. So here's an example from composting. Uh, we analyzed 49 high quality mags and uh, using the classification that I just showed you, uh, those 49 mags uh, fall into these, those three classes, 13, which are S mags, 20, which are CH mags, and 27, which are H mags. Okay, this is not the majority, not most, but nearly half. But if you look at uh, another metagenome, this one from a uh, reservoir, in other words, water, then this is dramatic, right? Uh, only one uh, mag uh, could be assigned a species. Four mags uh, were considered hypothetical, and 46 were uh, uh, H mags. And uh, I've, when you look at papers that present mags, you will see that uh, most max, what I said is true. Most max are hypothetical max. Uh, fortunately, uh, one development uh, which was published last year was uh, mag, a mag database, a uh, genomic catalog of Earth's microbiomes. Uh, this was published a year ago, and this was led by a group at the JGI. Um, and this catalog has 52,000 max. Uh, and thanks to such databases, uh, we now can monitor these databases and, uh, and check the rate at which HMAX become, become CHMAX. You know, I think that monitoring this rate is important because whenever an HMAX uh, finds a hit uh, somewhere else, uh, then uh, we can start to believe that uh, that HMAC is indeed uh, uh, has a biological reality. Uh, I, I should also mention that uh, another effort that uh, is underway in some lab, some labs around the world is uh, the so-called culturomics approach, in which uh, people are trying to experiment with different uh, nutrients so that they can increase uh the number of microbes that can be cultivated in the lab but of course this is uh, an effort which is very time consuming uh, uh, and is probably going to lag behind the, the rate of production of, of mags uh, for a very long time so i mentioned before phylogenetic placement as another Im important thing in the microbiome era uh, phylogenetic reconstruction is now much better than it was 26 years ago. And thanks to real mags, we now have an enormous amount of data to help understand microbial evolution. And in particular, the conserved uh, hypothetical mags or the HMAX have the potential for shedding enormous light on the so-called microbial dark matter. 
And you can see that from the title of this Nature Biotech paper in 2018, a standardized bacterial taxonomy substanti substantially revises the tree of life. The problem, the main problem now is not so much phylogenetic placement, but the issue of taxonomy versus phylogeny. Taxonomy uh, is always lagging behind. And uh, currently, uh, thousands of mags have been uh, published and, and we don't have uh, good names or, or uh, traditional names for them. And not only that, but uh, uh, because of, of, of the, the slow rate in which traditional taxonomy proceeds, some groups have started to propose new taxonomy systems. And this is a picture comparing two taxonomy systems from the paper that I mentioned in the previous slide. Uh, on the, the left-hand side, you have the NCBI taxonomy. On the right-hand side, you have the GTDB taxonomy. And in the paper, they are showing the differences between the two uh, systems. And of course, having more than one system for taxonomy uh, is a slippery slope that may take us into a taxonomic babble. And that would be a, a, a very bad development for the field. Uh, now I want to talk about the metadata problem. And this, I think, mainly applies to environmental genomes as opposed to uh, uh, MAGs from, uh, from humans, in which uh, metadata, I think, uh, is in a much better shape. And the motivation for this is uh, when you have several dozen homolog mags, so homolog mags, what is homolog mags? I, I'm extending the analogy I made before between protein coding genes by saying that mags that can be assigned, a mag that can be assigned to a known species is a homolog to, to, to the isolate genome uh, that is uh, correspond to that species. Uh, I'm stretching you know, uh, technical language a little bit here, but in any case, uh, if you have several dozen of these mags from different environments, uh, we would like to explain their different adaptations using their genomes. But metadata is crucial to answer this question. Uh, we need accurate and computable information on geographic location of samples, temporal data, day, time of day, physical chemical variables, temperature, pH, and so on. And it is a sad reality that we don't know these data for many samples. And I was careful to say that we don't know instead of we don't have, because I believe that most people who uh, do the sampling, most groups, when they go out and sample, they write down these meta metadata. But uh, for some reason, uh, uh, not always, uh, the data that people write down uh, make their ways into the genome repositories that we all check. And this makes life much more difficult when, you're, when you need metadata in order to uh, understand better uh, uh, environmental genomics, uh, the, 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 the influence of the environment in the organisms that you are studying. Okay, so I've at the end of my talk, and as a summary, uh, I want to say that the microbiome era has brought new challenges for bioinformaticians, and this means that job prospects remain good for whoever uh, works on bioinformatics, uh, but we still need lots of improvements. Uh, uh, I just uh, singled out two of these improvements. One is mag reconstruction methods because uh, they are at the base of everything else that follows and wide availability of computable metadata, as I just said. Uh, uh, one item that uh, I would like to mention just in passing is microbiota modeling. So with the increase of microbial genomes, with the availability of computable metadata, it becomes possible to start modeling uh, environments 
or, or the microbiota that lives in, a, in an environment, including its uh, interactions with hosts when there are hosts, such as plants, animals, or us humans. And that is really needed so that uh, the microbiome era has, can uh, start being a prediction science. That's what everyone would like. Uh, making predictions about perturbations of the microbiome and see what happens and so on and so forth. So uh, I, I believe we are already uh, in the early stages of microbiota modeling. And I believe that in the next decade, uh, this is going to be uh, one of the, the, the big uh, frontiers uh, in order for uh, developments of bioinformatics methods. Okay, uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, all the people who are working with me on uh, microbiomes, uh, starting with Alini Maria da Silva, uh, my colleague at the University of Sao Paulo, Laila Martins, and Roberto Terciano Pereira. They, all, they were all part of the MetaZoo project. And also more recently, Cassius Stevani, Renato Freire, and Etelvino Bechara. We are starting work on uh, uh, exciting new samples um, from uh, Universidade Federal do Rio de Janeiro. Uh, I'd like to mention Fabiano Thompson, uh, uh, who is uh, with whom I'm working on uh, metagenome data from um, uh, sponges uh, in the ocean, and also from uh, my group of students, uh, starting with Carlos, who is my technician in my lab, without whom uh, I wouldn't be able to do anything uh, that I currently do. And all these other students, uh, I, I will just leave the, the, the screen there for a few seconds so that you can read the names. I'm thankful to all of them, regardless of whether they work on uh, microbiomics or not. Uh, they all are uh, uh, a stimulus for me to uh, to uh, develop research and, and help them on their paths to becoming scientists. Uh, all of my research work has been funded at one time or another by FAPESP, CAPES, and SANPQ. And I'll, I'll also like to point out that the Sao Paulo Zoo uh, uh, was uh, very gracious in allowing us to sample uh, many environments that they have there and which allowed us to gain so much understanding about microbial genomics. And with that, I thank you, all of you, uh, for all your support and attention, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Raquel. Você tem que vir para cá. You want to just answer it from the from the chat, Joe? Yes. What did you say, Peter? So we have a we have a first question from from Nalvo, which I can't read because I have a stupid icon in this in the corner. Oh, now I can read it. Ah, yes. Yeah. Okay. So I'll read the question. Could phylogeny help transform some conserved hypothetical into species mag, or some hypothetical into conserved hypothetical? Um, I think that at this point, um, in order for you to uh, state that a mag is a species mag or is a conserved hypothetical, what you really need is a genome alignment. And a genome alignment is, is something that helps 
with phylogeny placement, but phylogeny placement, uh, you can't just rely on phylogeny placement. Um, one thing that phylogeny can help is the following. Suppose that a certain mag, you find out that it matches another mag somewhere else. By my definition, it would, that would um, qualify these two mags as conserved hypothetical mags, okay? But it might be that nobody looked at those two conserved hypothetical mags in order to determine whether they are close or far to some, to what is the taxonomic classification of those two mags. So in that situation, you could then uh, use genes from these two mags and do a phylogenetic reconstruction. And maybe by then you mm -hmm. could determine that they might belong to a certain species. However, this usually um, will not be the case because um, I can only think the situation in which there is a known species for which you don't have the genome. But, so how can it be that it is known? Well, it is, not, it is in the catalogs because someone sequenced, for example, the 16S RNA unit, right? But if, if the only thing you have is the 16S RNA, uh, it would be a little bit risky to state that your mag is the same species as that uh, other species. Because uh, 16S is, uh, is a short sequence, 1,500 base pairs long. Sometimes you only have... Uh, 400 pa base pairs available, and when you have that small a sequence, it's a little risky to infer species assignment. And so that's why I think uh, it's much better if you keep genome alignments as the standard for uh, classifying the max. Okay. So the next person also asked, Marcelle asked, is there some key alignment metrics like minimum ANI and coverage and so on? Yes. Well, uh, in 2017, uh, I think in Nature Biotech, uh, there was a paper which proposed some standards some quality standards for Max, and they uh, offered some numbers. For example, in order to be a high to qualify as a high quality Mag, uh, the contamination, as measured by a program such as CheckM, needs to be uh, no more than five percent, and you can also check. Uh, completeness of a MAC and completeness for a high quality MAG has to be at least 90%. So that's what in that proposed standard. But that doesn't say anything about species assignment, right? This is just the, the quality of, of, the, of the sequence that you have generated. In order to do species assignment, we rely on the practice uh, of um, of uh, average nucleotide identity. So uh, it has been the practice, as far as my experience uh, <clears throat> goes, that if you have, uh, if you align two genomes and you see that they have average nucleotide identity, at least 97% or 98%, then you can state that they belong to the same species. But you, you might ask, well, is it 97 or is it 98? There is no consensus. And if you ask too many detailed questions, uh, you will place me in an embarrassed position because we will start talking about taxonomy versus phylogeny. And taxonomy and phylogeny are two fields that uh, don't uh, 
talk very well. And uh, I am not a taxonomist. I, I, of course, am much more on the genomic side. And I have adopted in my practice uh, that number 98%. Uh, so all the metagenomes that I have recovered in the projects that I work on, Whenever we see an alignment to an isolate genome with a known species, such that the alignment has at least 98% uh, nucleotide identity, then we'll say, okay, it is the same species. Okay, I think I've answered Marcel's question. Um, I don't see any other questions here in the chat. Peter, your mic is off. Yeah, my mic is off. Yeah, uh, sorry, I have a couple of uh, of questions if there is nobody from the audience who takes precedence. So the, the first one would be if, uh, to what extent do you think can one use consistency of phylogenetic placement as a, as a way of supporting hypothetical max, as opposed to what the allegations from from the the Martin group was just mosaics of whatever crap that you have in your sample. To paraphrase what they wrote, <laughs> right? Yeah, they uh, uh, the, in their paper they focused on ribosomal proteins, and they detected that certain mags that had been published before uh, had an abnormal number of ribosomal proteins. So the pattern of ribosomal proteins was totally unexpected. So in that sense, uh, I, I think uh, yes, if you if you uh, if you look at the mag and you start seeing things that uh, are completely weird with respect to all the experience that came before, then I think uh, you have a legitimate reason to doubt the reality of, uh, of the MAC. Um, and uh, I, I think um, probably what we need is uh, to be a, a little more systematic. So uh, the check-in program, for example, when it checks for completeness, it will check the presence of certain key genes, single copy genes. Mm -hmm. And whenever the check and program detects that certain key genes that are single copy are present in more, more than once, then it will raise its um, contamination. Uh, I, I was talking about completeness. Yes, it's, it's both completeness and contamination. It's the bo both things. So the, uh, the check and program is systematic about that. So your question, Peter, points to a development uh, a further development of a check and like program, which would be, okay, uh, let us make systematic the knowledge we have about microbial genomes, be they bacterial genomes or archaeal genomes. And by systematic, I mean, well, let's take ribos the knowledge that Bill Martin's group have uh, about uh, ribosomal proteins. If, if they could make it systematic, not only ribosomal proteins, but the... Uh, I don't know, uh, uh, DNA polymerases uh, and so on. And all, all those uh, 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 essential genes, whether you find them duplicated or not and that kind of thing. And then use this extended check M, if you will, to check uh, a certain mag. Then uh, I think it would be possible to uh, either uh, sort of certify a mag, okay, it passes the test or it does not. Not sure whether I answered your question. Yeah, I was, I was also thinking uh, uh, about uh, checking whether all the different ribosomal proteins that uh, you find, for instance, or DNA polymerases or whatever more or less single copy genes you, uh, uh, you have, uh, that uh, if you place them 
individually into a phylogenetic tree. They should roughly fall into the same place, right? If the if the MEG is not is is one likely one species rather than a mosaic of right. of different things. Right. Except that as you know more than I do, there's always the ghost of lateral transfer. <laughs> yeah, so so you would believe a few lateral transfers, but not sort of, you know, a right. cow all over the place in the phylogenetic tree. Right. But where do you draw the line, right? Uh, I don't know. But we had another question from Marcela. Yes, another question. What about such a mosaic with several matches above 98? Well, the, the 98, uh, let me be clear about this, is the, a whole genome alignment. We're not talking about single gene alignment. You take one whole genome and you align it to another whole genome, and you get a, a, an average of 98% identity. Uh, if you have a mosaic, so I, I think your question is, maybe you, you still have a mosaic not a same species strain. Please remember that. We, I, uh, in, in my talk, a, a premise of my talk is that Max may be and most probably are mosaic of same species strains. So when you talk about mosaic being a bad thing, is a mosaic because you're talking about uh, completely different species from other genera, from other classes, other orders, horrible things like that, right? And you're probably arguing that uh, it could still be, uh, I don't see how that could happen. So because if you have an isolated genome in which you trust and you have 98% identity to that isolated genome in which you trust, then I can't see how our genome would still be a mosaic of different species. Because if, if that's the case, then your reference genome is also a mosaic, right? Thanks. More questions? We still have a little bit of time. So do you have any any ideas what to do about improving the let's say compliance with submitting meta, met the metadata for all these samples? Um, well, uh, the best possible way mm -hmm. would be a requirement by the journals. As you know, uh, most journals, if you report genome sequences or any kind of sequence to any distant journal, they will require you to show the accession number of that sequence, right? So suppose the journals start asking, you also have to um, make sure that the metadata of whatever you did is follows a certain standard is available for from certain repositories such as the gold genomes online database that's uh, the best database for microbial genomes that i know uh, if they put in place such a requirement uh, the compliance would go immediately up but of course the journals might be reluctant to do that because whenever they impose constraints on authors, authors may say, oh, I will publish somewhere else because I don't have to do this, all this boring stuff for this journal, I go to some, some, some other journal. I think it's a matter of time, Peter. Yeah, it's probably also a matter of getting kind of a stamp of approval. You you supplied in for sufficient metadata from the databases because otherwise it's hard for journal editors to check whether people really comply or just tick the box yeah. themselves. Yeah. 
Okay, so I think the the last Marcel's last question was you basically answered, right? Um not sure I understand the question. Um conserved feature right um yes um you the, the question is not so much conservation but consistency of conservation you see conservation all along the genome as opposed to you see sections conserved sections uh, scattered around your genome. If you have conserved sections scattered around the genome and mixed in with sections that are not conserved, that to me would be a sign of a mosaic, the kinds of bad mosaics that we want to avoid. Yeah, well, uh, you are true. Uh, uh, you're right that uh, the number of isolate genomes is much smaller than we would like them to be. There's this famous ratio that uh, most people talk about, that we know how to cultivate only 1% of the uh, microbial uh, populations in the biosphere uh, that if that is correct that means that uh, the 400,000 microbial genomes that we see on GenBank represent I don't know how many species they have 400,000 there's a lot of redundancy for for example E. coli I think probably there are now 50,000 genomes of E. coli there so the number of, of distinct species is probably in the thousands, maybe tens of thousands. And, and if that represents just 1% of all the diversity that there is in the biosphere, then there's a long way to go before we can get more, uh, uh, we, we, we can make a dent on this 1% fraction. Um, and but you know I, I mentioned culturomics. I I, uh, uh, I maybe there will be future developments that will uh, increase the rate at which we know we have uh, isolate genomes. Um, the mags the mags have been a tremendous contribution to. Uh, to microbiology, microbial genomics, but uh, uh, I think I, I I probably made it clear in my talk that uh, we certainly need the anchors represented by isolate genomes. Without those anchors, uh, we can uh, say all we want about hypothetical mags. Uh, the 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 uh, structure on which this whole thing uh, is developed will be on a shaky basis. And in order to make this foundation stronger is to increase the number of uh, isolate genomes uh, for which we know the sequence. Marcel is saying that uh, uh, we should not allow uh, fragmented genomes to be deposited. Well, that would be a radical proposition. Um, and uh, it, it's, I can make a, a little historical comment on that. Uh, when I started working on the Xylella fastidiosa genome, the gold standard for publishing was the finished bacterial genome. Uh, and for many years, until at least 2004, 
uh, every genome published was complete, finished, no gaps. Um, but then uh, there started this whole NGS thing, next generation thing, next generation sequencing. And because, and that's a wonderful thing. I'm, I'm not, I'm not criticizing NGS by no means, by any means. But NGS, one one result of NGS was that uh, the work of finishing a genome without gaps became relatively much more expensive than simply doing draft genomes. And if you look again at those 400,000 uh, microbial genomes at GenBank, the number of complete genomes is a small fraction of those 400,000. And you could say, well, you know, that's a bad thing because there's so much, you know, lurking behind these 400,000 microbial genomes. There, there probably are lots of mistakes, errors, contaminations, and so on. And you're right. But uh, on the other hand, science made tremendous progress thanks to the uh, decrease in costs of sequencing. And if you, my, my sense is that if you uh, compare the benefits of next generation sequencing against the uh, disadvantages, uh, the drawbacks, I think the benefits far out, outweigh the drawbacks. And it's incumbent upon us, by informaticians, genomicists, to uh, try to point out uh, entries in the gene bank which are wrong, which have problems, and so that we can improve the quality of those data. Yeah, I would second that very much. There is. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, it's a part of the bioinformatician's job security that we have all these fragmented genome data because there is a need to develop tools and methods that actually can deal with data that are less than perfect. Right. <laughs> On this note, Jean, let me let me thank you again uh, for your uh, very nice presentation and for the discussion. And uh, before we leave today, uh, I hand back the staff of the chairman to the organizers in case there is any announcement. Okay, thank you, Peter. Thank you, Professor Setubin, Professor Peter. Um, so the, the only announcement is that uh, we see you again at 2 p.m. for the first uh, short course about uh, machine learning in bioinformatics. It's going to be in Portuguese. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Auf Wiedersehen. Auf Wiedersehen. <laughs> <laughs>